that it's really challenging in modern day to find good solutions for how to how to hack this uh, this reward based learning system. So you can see in the next slide where uh, I show this um, this loop again in a little more cleaned up form. We can have positive cues. We can have negative cues that feed in uh, to our brains as positive and negative affect. We have these urges to continue these good feelings and to make the unpleasant feeling goes goes feelings go away. We I'm just using examples. We smoke or we eat, and then these get reinforced as um, as memories. And this is what's formally called positive and negative reinforcement in modern psychology. These, um, these loops also increase the, the salience for cues that are similar in the future. So we're more likely to eat ice cream when we're sad, for example, or when we get yelled at by our boss. And you can see at the bottom of the slide, there is a ton of research that supports this. This was uh, reported way back in, eight, in the late 1800s by Ed Thorndike. B.F. Skinner became famous for this in the 40s and 50s with his Skinner boxes. And of course, Eric Kandel won the Nobel Prize in 2001, showing that this is evolutionarily conserved all the way back to the sea slug. So positive and negative reinforcement, these are the most uh, evolutionarily conserved. These are the oldest driving forces uh, in known to man in terms of learning. So it's important if we're trying to change behavior, it's very important to understand how behavior gets laid down so that we can then affect it. I think of this as similar to uh, cancer treatment. If we're trying to treat a specific cancer, it's really helpful to know what protein kinase pathway is mutated. And if we can target that specifically, we get a very effective treatment with very few side effects. So can we do the same thing with behavioral treatment. For example, if somebody's trying to quit smoking, or if they are stress or emotional eating, or even with things like anxiety, where the people get caught up in these habit loops of rumination. Now, there is some decent data, if we look at these mechanistically, uh, to, so for example, I show with this blue box, avoidance of cues. If we avoid people, places, and things, for example, that's a saying with, uh, with people with alcoholism who are trying to uh, cut down on their drinking, if they avoid the bars, if they avoid their drinking buddies, uh, they're less likely to drink. It makes a lot of sense. And mechanistically, we can see how this fits with this habit loop pathway. For other behaviors such as smoking, and I show this here with substitute behaviors, it becomes more challenging because we can't avoid our front porch, we can't avoid our car, we can't avoid uh, the, the, all the different places that we smoke. So here, um, I work with my patients to say, okay, let's try to find some other behavior. So for example, if they eat some candy or they chew on their pen cap or they go for a walk, they can substitute some other type of behavior that's less uh, destructive than smoking when they've got a craving. But the problem here is you can see whether it's avoidance of cues or providing substitute behaviors, this habit loop itself, this, um, as you can see by the orange arrows, it's not dismantled at its core. This is a very important uh, this is a very important concept. And if we look all the way back to the Buddhist psychologists, they really highlighted this core habit loop as being really important to dismantle. So here's a, here's a phrase from one of the earliest uh, sayings in the Pali Canon, just as a tree though cut down can grow again and again if its roots are undamaged and strong, in the same way if the roots of craving are not wholly uprooted, sorrows will come again and again. So they're really highlighting that craving is a critical aspect here around, um, uh, around perpetuation of habits. And if we can't uproot that craving, we're going <laughs> to, our sorrows, sorrows are going to come again and again. Uh, in my next slide, I like this modern day interpretation a little bit more as Mick Jagger sings about um, not, you know, not getting satisfied. And in fact, uh, in some of the lyrics of this song, he actually talks about smoking. So in the next slide, I really break this down to it's really uh, the simplest elements for reward-based learning. We need a trigger, we need a behavior, and we need a reward. So for example, if we're stressed out, that's the trigger. We eat a cupcake, that's the behavior, and we feel a little bit better, that's the reward. And the more we do this, the more we learn to literally train ourselves to eat cupcakes when we're stressed out. And we can see how that is some type of a samsaric endless wandering loop because cupcakes might not and generally don't fix whatever the cause of the, tr uh, the stress is in the first place.